I think going from nothing to the first version of ChatGPT was maybe like the biggest system shock most people will feel. Because it was like, all right, there wasn't this thing at all, and now there's this thing. And sure, it wasn't very good, but the the zero to one moment is a big deal. And maybe we've now gone from like one to 10, and in some sense that should feel like a bigger deal, but I think it doesn't quite to most people. And maybe we go from like 10 to 100 in the next 18 months. Uh, but I think like everybody's already accepted that AGI is gonna happen. Right. I want you to really lock in on this number, 18 months. Because some of the absolute sharpest minds in AI, the people on the inside, are saying that by 2027, that is not even two full years away, we hit a point of, well, a point of no return. Not decades, not some sci-fi future, years. And the quiet part they aren't saying out loud, we are nowhere near ready. So in this video, we're not just gonna look at some clips, we're going to connect the dots. We're going to take Sam Altman's own roadmap for the future and slam it up against the alarm bells being rung by the very people who helped him build it. This isn't just another AI explainer. This is the timeline, the one that's actually unfolding right now and why these next couple of years might just decide everything. First up, the first thing to completely break software as we know it. Okay, so the first thing you have to understand is that the entire concept of an app is about to become a fossil. Think about your workflow right now. You click, you drag, you navigate menus that someone else built for you. Our entire digital life is a collection of these rigid, pre-built boxes. But Sam Altman sees a world where we just bulldoze the whole structure. He's talking about a future where the best software is literally no software. Now listen to what he says here. He drops a phrase that is an absolute bombshell for the entire software industry. I don't know, yeah, I, I, my instinct would be faster, but I haven't thought about that much. Um, the, the thing that I've been focused on is what it, you know, most of my, most of my time outside of OpenAI I spent with sort of software companies. And I, I've thought that I have understood the sort of like physics of software companies for a while, but if we're heading towards a world where any software you want can be like just in time written, and if you want to do something, you can just like type something into an AI chatbot and get a great piece of software built. Uh, and so instead of like, you know, going to like buy this SaaS company's product or that one, you just say like run and it happens. That, that feels like a very significant change that is not that far away. Just in time written. That's it. That's the whole ball game. What he's describing is the death of the application and the birth of the agent. Let me break this down. Forget opening Excel, you just talk to your machine. You say, analyze our Q3 sales data, find the top three regional growth drivers, and build me a 10 slide deck for the board meeting tomorrow morning. And the AI doesn't open a program, it becomes the program. In the background, in a blink, it writes a custom single-use piece of code to do exactly what you asked, executes it, and then poof, the code vanishes. All you see is the result. And look, this isn't some far off sci-fi thing. The first shockwaves are already here. We all saw the demos for Devon, right? Cognition Lab's AI software engineer. It took a prompt, wrote the code, debugged its own mistakes, and deployed a website. It literally went on Upwork and started completing freelance jobs. That is the beginning. What this really means is the value is shifting. It is not about the tool anymore. It is about the outcome. For the SaaS economy, all those companies we pay monthly subscriptions to, this is an extinction level event whistling over their heads. For us, the gap between an idea and making it real is about to collapse to zero. But what happens when the AI isn't just building the tools, but the human jobs are about using them? Okay, so this is the big one. The question everyone asks, what about my job? We have all seen the AI art, the essays. We know it's coming for cognitive work. And Sam's answer here is, honestly, it's fascinating. It's both incredibly optimistic and kind of terrifying at the same time. In that time period, is there a profession and in our audience are entrepreneurs that are building AI doctors, AI therapists, AI oncologists, 
AI structural engineers, AI chip designers, of course, AI software engineers, um, AI salespeople, AI marketing people, AI accountants. Like, that's all happening today. I'm presuming all that, whether these companies are successful or some competitors successful, will be mature. Or their jobs, 2035 and beyond, in the intellectual world, and we'll come back to the physical world, that AI won't be able to do at least 80% of. It, there, are a lot, there are a lot of jobs that I don't think you want an AI to do, um, or, or that many people don't want an AI to do, and there will be new kinds of jobs that people particularly want a person to do. I, I think we're, we're very oriented towards caring about other people. Um, and I think that, speaking of these like deep biological things, I, I think that's one of them. So, yeah, maybe you could have like a, a great... AI teacher, and it will not be as motivating to you as a mediocre human teacher. I could totally believe that. I could totally believe there's like something very deep in just knowing that it's a real person or not. Yeah, I might disagree with you on that. I think an AI teacher can do so much more and understand you so much better. But I, I think there will be a far better AI investor than you very soon. And I uh, no question about it. Well, no, no. But I personally still enjoy having dinner with you. And you know, if you tell me like good job or you should do this, that's more motivating to me than an AI telling me that. And so, so I think you'll still have a job. So I, I so I absolutely agree with you. Um, no question, my job isn't any safer than most other jobs. Much less safe. Uh, uh, on the merits, yeah. but there's this other point. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Mark Andreessen claims it's the only job venture that'll be safe, but I disagree with him fundamentally. He basically admits AI will be better at almost every thinking job, including his own. But he argues there's one last fortress where humans will always have the advantage. Did you catch that? Knowing that it's a real person. This is his entire bet. He's betting on the one thing he believes AI can't truly replicate. Genuine human-to-human -human connection. Empathy. Motivation. He uses the teacher example. An AI tutor can have all the knowledge, sure, but can it look a student in the eye after they failed the test and say, I believe in you, and have it actually mean something? Can it inspire them? He's betting no. The value shifts from the what, the information, to the who, the coach, the mentor, the leader. It's a nice idea, right? A comforting one. But then you look at the numbers. Goldman Sachs says 300 million full-time jobs could be automated. 300 million. The optimistic take is that we all just move up the value chain to these more human roles. But that transition, it is going to be brutal. It requires us to completely rewire how we think about work, education, and value itself. And that brings us to the biggest, most world-altering part of his vision, the part where the rules of economics as we know them get thrown out the window. This is where things go from just changing industries to rewriting the fundamental rules of society. OpenAI's mission statement sounds like typical Silicon Valley fluff, ensure AGI benefits all of humanity. Yeah, okay. But when you hear Altman break down what that actually means, whoa, he sees AGI as the most powerful deflationary force in history. And people Listen. do amazing things. And I think like there are a lot of people who, I think there are a lot of people who think that oh, you know, the world is not ready for this. They can't handle it. There's only a few people that can understand it. There's that paper. There's many others. But I think people really kind of do know what they need, and they're pretty good about learning how to use new technology. And it's, and again, this is not like theoretical. This is like at mass scale happening today. And I think it's quite wonderful. And it's happening because like the existing systems and incentives in the world are phenomenal in many ways. Uh, again, there will be some things we have to do differently. If AI starts making massive scientific discoveries, you know, some company will use AI to discover cures for every cancer. And I hope those people get really rich, but also everybody else in the world, I hope they get a cheap cure for cancer. Someone uses AI to make fusion commercializable. I hope those people get really rich, but the whole world will benefit from plummeting electricity prices. So I, I kind of just think like technology on the whole, does a lot to spread massive global benefit. 
and the story of the last couple of hundred years has been that. And we should not be ashamed of that. We should not like try to explain away why what we do is not as not so evil. Like it's it's really been great. Um, a force for more equality. Think about that. For all of modern history, access to the best stuff, elite education, top tier medical care, expert legal advice has been a function of money. Why? Because the experts are expensive, their time is scarce. AI makes expert intelligence abundant. The marginal cost of an AI doctor's opinion is basically zero. The price just collapses. The knowledge that used to be locked up in the brains of the top 1% becomes available to anyone with a phone. It's a vision of radical abundance. You can see how ideas he's pushed for years like universal basic income suddenly click into place. If the cost of living plummets and AI is generating unimaginable wealth, you can afford to give everyone a foundation to stand on. But and this is the trillion dollar question. There's a massive catch. Who owns the machine that prints the intelligence? If one or two companies control the foundational AGI, does that create equality? Or does that create the single greatest concentration of power in human history? This is the central tension, and it is why the final form of this technology is so critical. So what's the final form? What does this all lead to? It is not an app. It is not a website. It is what he calls a personal AGI. Uh, and I don't know what numbers you use for publicly for the number of chat GPT users today. Um, what's your vision for chat GPT going forward? Like, um, uh, The vision for OpenAI is that we would like to build a small suite of products and a platform that you can use with any other service to be sort of your default personal AGI. Um, this is a system that will get to know you, that will be connected to your stuff, that will behave the way you want. And if you want to use it as a through a chat interface, fine. If you want to go use social products or entertainment products in a new way, great. If you want to get a lot of work done with agents and a bunch of other stuff, also great. And if you want to be able to just log into any other service and sort of bring your intelligence there, we'll have that too. Um, over time, that'll expand to new kinds of services. I think there's like a really important new kinds of computers to build, um, and we want our users to have those too. But, you know, I think people are going to have a very important relationship with an AI that will help them be more productive, better, happier, whatever, just smoother their life, and we'd like to be that. It's the OS for your life. It's connected to your email, your calendar, your files. It knows your goals, your preferences, your voice. It acts on your behalf across the entire internet. It's the agent that makes everything else we have talked about possible. And this, this is where the story, this incredible vision of the future, takes a very, very dark turn. Because the people with the best view of how fast we're approaching this are screaming that we need to slow down. In May 2024, Daniel Coco Tyler resigned. This isn't some blogger. This is a guy from inside OpenAI's governance and forecasting team. His job was to predict AI timelines. His forecast, based on what he was seeing internally, a 50% chance of AGI by 2027. Let that land for a second. His quote is chilling. The world will become very strange very quickly. And he wasn't alone. This wasn't one disgruntled employee, this was a pattern. OpenAI's co-founder and arguably one of the godfathers of the whole field, Ilya Sutskever, gone. Jan Like, the man literally co-leading the team in charge of making sure this stuff doesn't go rogue and kill us, gone. And Like's resignation letter was a tactical nuke. He said safety culture had taken a backseat to shiny products. He said he was sailing against the wind, fighting for the resources to get ahead of the problem. This isn't an external critic. This is a five alarm fire being pulled from inside the control room. The people who know the most are telling us the race to build the God machine is massively outpacing our ability to control it. They see the same exponential curve Sam Altman does, but they see an existential risk being brushed aside for the next product launch. So where does this leave us? You've got these two parallel stories happening at the same time. On one track, you have Sam Altman's vision of a utopian future, a world of abundance powered by a personal AI that unlocks human potential. 
And on the other track, you have the chief architects of that system jumping off the train, waving their arms and warning us that the brakes aren't working. The technology for just-in-time software is here. The automation of cognitive jobs has begun. The roadmap for a personal AGI is on the whiteboard. The debate is no longer if this is coming. The evidence from inside and outside is clear. It's coming. And it's coming with a velocity that is hard to comprehend. The real question, the one we all need to start asking is this. When a technology promises to give us everything we have ever wanted, but its own creators are warning we might lose control, who do you trust to be behind the wheel? If this breakdown gave you a new way to think about this, you know what to do. Like and subscribe for more deep dives, but more importantly, drop a comment below. Do you think the benefits of racing to AGI outweigh these massive risks? I really want to know what you think.